You, you can't depend on nobody. It's just you and God, see? See? And standing alone with God can be kind of frightening because most people are accustomed to physical things. Well, you got to stand with God, you know. You, it can be frightening. But that's where they got to go, see? And they say, well, I, I don't understand the crowd because I feel safe in a group. I don't feel safe alone. So, because because when you get into truth, you got to stand alone. You, 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 truth is truth is truth is truth is truth. So you have to stand alone. So they don't don't relish that. Our direct action department, under the direction of Reverend James Bevel, then decided to attack the very heart of the political structure of the state of Alabama and the Southland through a campaign for the right to vote. And when Johnson made his speech on January, June, March the 15th, that was probably the most, most thankful moment that I've experienced. Because, see, that has never, that, what he said, has been done by only three men in history, Moses, Gandhi, and James Bevel, who enfranchise a people without armed struggle. And I'm, I'm very grateful that God used me in that way. I am very thankful, you know, that, that God took this fellow and allowed him to be instrumental in enfranchising the people without murder. You know, see, cause we could have gone down the Taliban, the PLO, Hamas. They went down a route. America could be in chaos. But we went down a route that brought the Christ principle to consciousness. When I was a little boy, we lived in the country, so they used to kill hogs, ducks, chickens, cows, fish. And when they killed ducks, I had a particular affinity toward ducks because they'd be around ponds. And, and these particular ducks and I really got along. They'd be. <laughs> so when they killed this duck, I guess it may have been Easter, probably. It was like it was so painful. Y'all killing my duck. <laughs> well, one day I asked my dad, I said, Dad, why do men fight? He said, because they're foolish. <laughs> I said, are you saying there's no reason to fight? He said, no. <laughs> he said, I said, that's all. He said, that's all. What about your mom? Well, she was more like a religious person, but she like uh, wasn't Christ conscious. He was like Christ conscious. And what I mean by that, he had an experience with Christ. He didn't join a religious order like a, uh, I'm a Baptist. He went to the Baptist church, but he didn't, he wasn't a sectarian. He was just like a free spirit. And, um, and labels and colors and all that never made any difference to him. And um, he would always test, test people's hearts. But then my mother never did do that. She was kind of religiously rigid. She's a good woman, but she didn't ever t attain to that kind of consciousness. So fornicating with a woman 
uh, was sort of like uh, killing the duck too for me. It never did resonate with me as something right to do. I did it, but I didn't. It never did resonate with me as something right to do. It was not something I could be proud of. You know, it's, I just never. I, I never did see it in those terms. Did you wait till you were married to to have sex? Mm. I started having sex when I was three. With people in your that yeah. you knew. Yeah, little girls around about, you know, they just give you sex. So if you around about playing under the house in the barn, the girls was going to make sure you had sex. So that, that wasn't a thing. It's like they was going to do that. They was going to. So th th in the South, those girls was like more aggressive in terms of, because they didn't have a monetary value tied to their sex. See, so they weren't selling sex. They just give you sex. Because they didn't see you as a stranger. They saw you as a member of the family. See, well, you, that's what you need. Like if, you, if, you, like if a boy get all riled up and mad, this, he needs sex. <laughs> that's his problem. <laughs> that's why he's mad with everybody. So. <laughs> yeah, I really, I really uh, miss uh, King. Because when he lived, I at least had a, a collaborator. Um, that is, he, he really believed um, in the nonviolent movement, in the nonviolent principle. And he really would stand, when that was clarified, he'd take hits for it. That is, he'd stand. Well, you don't have that now. Because basically, I'm a technician, see? Like a strategist and a tactician. Well, he was like a philosopher, see? And uh, when you're doing tactical work, you need a philosopher because you need somebody to interpret that. A decision to sit in at local lunch counters on February 13th, 1960 was reached after much debate. The adults, mostly ministers, of the NCLC the Nashville Christian Leadership Conference, met with the students at movement headquarters and tried to persuade them to postpone demonstrations for a couple of days until money could be raised. According to Reverend Smith, we had no lawyers and we felt kind of parental responsibility for those college kids. And we knew that they were going to be put in jail and we didn't know what else would happen. And so some of us said, we need to wait until we get a lawyer, until we raise some funds. The SCLC leaders told the students that the money could be collected through churches within a week. Then according to Reverend Smith, James Bevel, then a student at the American Baptist Seminary, said that I'm sick and tired of waiting, which was a strange thing to come from a kid who was only about 19. I was a little older than that, but I looked like the 19 years, I guess. You see, the rest of us was older. Bevel said, if you asked us to wait until next week, then next week something else would come up, and you would say, wait until the next week, and maybe we would never get our freedom. He said this, I believe that something would happen in the situation that will make for the solution to some of these problems we're talking about. So we decided to go on. So you are sick. What is it? Pancreatic uh, cancer. Now the question I ask if people, did you hear a lie? See, a lie is told. Anytime people can't get nothing done, a lie has been told. Did you hear a lie in that? Okay, the lie is we need money and a lawyer. No, we need courage and integrity. See, now if you go along with this lie that we need money and a lawyer, you ain't going to never move because you ain't got no money. What is the prognosis? Six weeks to six months. Much pain? No pain. So the, the preacher was lying to us. He was afraid. But he wouldn't say, well, man, I'm scared, you know, da, da, da. 
He said, well, we need the money and a lawyer. To, we don't know. So in a movement, you got to hear the first lie. Because if you don't correct the first lie, the second lie show up, third lie show up, during the Freedom Ride, which was the next year. Uh, riding the bus, bus caught on fire. Jim Farmer called the Freedom Ride off. Jim Farmer said, well, it's too dangerous. Did you hear the lie? Too dangerous. It's dangerous, but it's not too dangerous. See, you got to hear the first lie. And you got to overrule the first lie. No, Mr. Farmer, it's dangerous, but it's not too dangerous. No, Rem Smith, uh, would be good if we had some money lawyer, but that's not really what we need. We need courage and integrity. See, because if you listen to the old people, you repeat the same mistake that they made last year. If all of that studies and advice got them sitting on the back of the bus, why do you think they're going to give you some proper advice? And that's what people say, well, he's radical, or he's crazy, because now you, the other people don't hear the lie necessary. I mean, they really don't hear it. They just... But if you haven't been grounded in the question of dignity, you're not going to hear that lie. That's why you have to go back to this principle of Jesus. You have heard that it was said to the men of old, you shall not kill, and whoever kills should be liable to the judgment. But I say to you, don't be angry. Don't insult, don't call a man a fool. Get all of this stuff out of you. The fear, the anger. And then you can see. You got to be distinctly different from the opposition. And you have to mean that from your heart, and you have to carry that out in your conduct. Because what God and nature show you is the options. You, you can't see those options until you make this, res, this resolution. Just like when I went to Christ and said, you're right and I'm wrong on hating people. So he said, this is what you should be doing. You should be breaking out nobody's window and running. You should have a sit-in movement. You don't need to curse out white people and go around with negative attitudes. You need to have a, a freedom ride. You don't need to do what you need to do, Birmingham. I will show you the alternative to, to, to hate and violence. And he said, well, I will show you the alternative to lust and fornication. See? So when I took this to Martin King, his position was I'd rather be dead than to correct that. See, I said, well, man, what have you done so bad that you can't confess to your wife? So like I said, now, it's obvious to me if you can't confess to your wife, it ain't your wife. Somebody else's wife. You have heard that it was said to the men of old, you should not commit adultery. Saying, well, Christ, you're right and I'm wrong. When Christ started teaching me, got rid of hate, got rid of violence. Then when I looked around and black folks weren't moving, I said, well, what's wrong? All the logs off the road, the road is clear. They sit up in the middle of the road complaining. What's wrong with these people? So I opened up a clinic and found out that they all committed in their private lives to fornication. Oh, okay. Why hadn't I seen that? So, well, because you've been so immersed in your culture, you can't see the truth when it's written. That's when I started to trip out. What, what about divorce? How do we look at divorce? Well, I don't agree with divorces. So I've never participated in them. I agree to marry. And I agree to do work. And when people say, well, I, I can't. The road is too rough. The, the way is too steep. I don't try to make someone be married. All I can do is practice marriage. See, marriage is a science you practice. It's not somebody you get. It's a science you practice. Principles you are practicing. If the other person says, well, I'm not going to practice these principles, what can you do? You can teach. You can 
and invite them to the clinic. Just like you, you can't get everybody in Birmingham to be nonviolent. You can't get everybody to say, I'm going to fight for the right to vote. You get as many folks as you can. Or you said to a sister, sister, you know, Reverend Bell, you're absolutely right. I can see exactly what you're talking about. And six months later, she said, look, man, this is hard. Just like Jesus said, this road is hard. I don't want to. I want to tread this road. I understand because it is hard. My being in, in, in prison ain't no theatrics. That's on this road. You know, being chained to a bed and cell my theatrics, that's on the road. Uh, not working for money but putting your treasures in heaven, that's on the road. So when you, when you become a disciple of Christ, and you agree and don't turn back, then you agree to go to the cross. You know, you don't agree to go to church twice a week, once a week and sing a hymn. You agree to become a collaborator with this man and establish the kingdom of God on earth. And you got to do what he does. Because he'd be like a man in the water swimming and you walking along the bank talking. You got to be in the water swimming with this guy. You know, Adam could have gone along with God or could he went along with Eve. See, he had the option to go along with God or go along with Eve. He chose to go along with Eve. Most men agree to compromise and go along with the female when they know she's wrong because he don't want to be by himself because he want a, a sex toy. He's not interested in a scientist. It's interesting, see, it's like, uh, I'm James Bevel. And some folk go make up to him a James Bevel <laughs> and bring him into court and claim that that's me. Well, that's all right, it just ain't me. So then when you see it from that perspective, you don't say, oh, that's my daughter, she shouldn't do that. That's a human being. And a human being in error does what a human being in error does. So why were why were you convicted by the state of Virginia? I haven't been convicted yet by the state of Virginia because the trial ain't over yet. See? That's the first round. That's like saying uh, Joe Lewis lost in the first round. He ain't the fight ain't over yet. See, I, if you if you would classify me professionally in America, I would be classified as a a sociological surgeon. I didn't get the chance to present the science to the court. And that's what I meant when I said I didn't get a fair trial. I just need the opportunity to walk the court through the science. See? And when I walk the court through the science, if the court find me guilty of that, then I have a problem with the courts. And I walk the science through the country. I put it in the, in the public court. See? Because the young people are rising up, young women, and seeing the futility in being fornicators. They're they starting to see that. This is futile, eh? They're just, just a dead in street. That fornication is a false friendship. It's a gift of a false friendship. Nothing to it. Keep you all emotionally bogged up, hostile, ha hassling folk, and nothing coming from it. And you're not doing anything you're supposed to be doing that's intelligent and right that lasts. I think the most important thing that I've learned is that if you be loving and truthful and maintain that, you have the power to produce justice and equity, and that every human being have that power. Jesus is just as serious about me telling white guys, no, you gotta treat me right, as he is about telling me you gotta treat females right. Same thing. Jesus is right, James Bell is wrong. 
You going around hating people? You ain't right. So I stopped discussing how bad Bull Connor and how bad white people. When you hate people, you something wrong with you. See? When you lust for sister, something wrong with you. See, so I started working on, I didn't, I don't demand a sister stop lusting, fornicating. I put the discipline on myself. I stopped, but I lost all my jealousy. So I instruct a sister not to fornicate, not because I'm jealous and she's going to give away my stuff, but because it's not good for her development. So I teach her the same lesson I teach myself. This is not for me to own a piece of meat. This is for you to be proper as a citizen. But I feel about you for the kid just like I feel about me for the kid. It ain't going to work. So I will teach you the, the negative consequences that come from this. See? Did you ever have any kind of sexual relationship with your daughter? No. I do clinic work, which is not a sexual relationship in terms of how you guys think of sex, that would be like, uh, if you, you ask me, you could ask me, say, well, did you stir up violence in Birmingham? I said, no. You go get pictures, I said, no, that violence showed up, but I was doing this. I said, I don't have no reason to have fornication with my daughter because I need, see at the time, I had just finished doing a project in Chicago called SEED, Students for Education and Economic Development, where we had taught a lot of young people the thermodynamic economy, where you pray, our father, our church, and where you develop your institutions and your businesses. So it's like, that's what I was teaching. So you can't play sex and teach that. So like you can't play, you can't do violence and teach. You get the right to vote with nonviolence. See, so that that just wouldn't be an interest. That, that interest in me, having sex with my daughters, is no no more interest than my having sex with my son. My daughter Sherry here, she. I mean, it's just it's a family. I mean, it's just like that. Just that's not even something that. Uh, is an option that I'd be interested in. I'm just not interested in that. When I was uh, was saying to God about how my Bob in the church, he, he says to me, "Well, because you have not done all that you are supposed to do." You are more responsible for the church being blown up than down my Bob. I don't want to accept that. That's true. And the reason I could change it and nobody else could, 10 million black males couldn't let them change, because I had the courage to say that. Jim Belville, you are responsible for this. I don't need to get into no other black man and no other white man. James Belville, you are responsible for this. And that's what females don't want to say. I'm responsible for prostitution. And I'm taking my investment out of that. See, and, and that's where the problem is because that's why I said it's going to be a hard one because who wants to be on the front line with that? So you say, well, oh, that was this man, this man, James Farmer. Name all the guys you want to name. Why couldn't they get the right to vote? And I could. See, nobody have asked that question. Am I smart? No. It's a principal employer. And in that principle is employed, it gives you the power to change. And until you bring the change, you're still responsible for the crime. I told you I loved her. I mean, I love some people and I haven't forgiven them, I guess. I'm still angry. Well, well, you don't love them yet. You got to go deep. Once you find out that present misconduct 
has a historical cause. And generally, the cause precedes even the birth of the person that you're mad at. That's why it's unconscious. It didn't even happen in their lifetimes. So when you start going back, that's why you identify the problem, define the problem, and start going back to the cause. And that's why Jesus said, forgive them, because they don't even know what they're doing. Their conduct, they are victims of a conduct that took place back here. They are victims of a conduct that they don't even understand its cause. 